without further ado, we'll be talking about um, navel orange worm and how it continues to be the number one pest in the almond industry. And this session we'll be talking about what happened this year, what are some of the challenges that we faced, whether it is something that we should continue to be concerned about, and approaches that we can take in order to reduce populations. So um, first we're gonna have our, my name's Lauren Fan. I am the uh, pest management specialist for the Almond Board of California. Um, and I am going to let, um, hand it over to Justin Nay with Integral Ag, who will be leading through questions and discussion and introducing the speakers and be giving the closing remarks. So from here on out is Justin A with Integral Ag. Good morning, good morning. It's nice to see this well attended. After the worm year we just experienced, I'm surprised not everybody is here, but uh, um, there's gonna be some changes. I'm not gonna be giving a presentation as it might be in your agenda. I don't believe Joel Siegel is as well. and in place, David Haviland, UCNR is going to be presenting, Mel Machado and uh, Tim Birmingham from the Alma Board. Um, and uh, just some preliminary um, questions to keep things going. If you have a question at the end, you can use the, the microphone or sp speak up loudly so everyone can hear. Um, and uh, some questions for you, David, on your talk. Uh, some things that we want to think about is uh, just in a general sense, what happened this year? You know, what, what were the gaps in our IPM program? What went right, what went wrong? And, uh, and um, where do we go from here? So if you could address some of those during your talk, greatly appreciate it. And uh, for you, sir. All right, get going. All right, well, good morning. So th that is a challenging task. Um, you know, as you know, Naval Orange Room this year was, uh, you know, the bane of, of, uh, of, of oh, cycle through here, here we go. Uh, you know, was, was very much a struggle this year uh, with Naval Orange Room. And the, the task I've been given was to give a recap of what happened, sort of why it happened, where do we go from here. And the approach I want to take to this is, is if you're a sports person, it's kind of like a, a sports center approach. Um, you know, anytime a game's about to start, there's the keys to the game, you know, the things that need to be done by the teams to accomplish their goal of winning, followed by the post-game report, the sort of a recap of how those either were or not, or were not achieved. And so the, you know, so the title here, you know, Naval Orange Room 2023, what happened and what to do about it. Well, the keys to the game come back to things you've heard for decades. Uh, and we call these the four pillars of a Naval Orange Room Integrated mess Pest Management Program. So we've got the winter sanitation, mating disruption, uh, insecticides, and timely harvest. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase right here, um, as if this is our last slide, and just talk about what happened. So winter sanitation. One year ago, we had growers saying, ouch, price forecast is not looking so good. Where do we cut spending? So a lot of people either didn't sanitize uh, or did a lower quality level of sanitation than normal in an effort to cut costs. Um, you know, certainly justified there or you know, to think through that. Um, and then some people, of course, couldn't get in because of the rain. So um, just overall, sanitation wasn't to the standard it normally is. Uh, mating disruption, a lot of people this year saw it as a cost instead of an investment. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that later on. Um, insecticides, just spray programs are out of whack. Okay, that was a curveball that Mother Nature threw at us, and, and I'll go through that. And then timely harvest was literally impossible in 2023, um, just with how delayed the trees were. You can't shake a tree till it's ready to go. So let me walk through these a little bit. And the first thing I want to do is, is define sanitation. Um, I do hear people say, I shook my trees, I sanitized. Okay? That's not exactly what sanitation means. Let's see, what did I push? Looks like there's a cord coming in and out. Okay, um, so, so there's four steps to sanitation. There's the shaking process, get them off the trees, a polling process, okay, to get the numbers down to a threshold, and then you're blowing and you're mowing. All of them are needed. And here's why. So it's kind of scientific, mechanistically. Let me take you back to a really old study on the x-axis here, this is number of mummies. The y-axis is the amount of damage. 
In this case, when you go from 20 mummies down to 10 mummies, what sort of reduction in damage do you get here? Okay. When you go down by 10, there's about a 3% reduction in damage. But look down here in this part of the curve. Okay, do you see it's not a straight line? So in this case, you went from 3 to 1. Okay, that's only a reduction of two mummies. But that was another 3% reduction in damage. So can you see the farther you go in reducing the number of mummies is the more impactful sanitation is. And why is that? Um, on the front end, when you're knocking mummies off and, and just reducing them, you're getting rid of worms. Okay, that's good. That's beneficial. But once you get down into these really low numbers, you're reducing worms. But anything that survives is struggling to find mates. If they do mate, they're struggling for a place to lay their eggs. And the amount of energy it takes, uh, you know, imagine if you're a moth that has to lay 50 eggs and you have two mummies per tree. You have to find every single mummy on each of 25 trees to lay 50 eggs, assuming you never come back to the same, egg, uh, the same mummy. Okay? That's why we drive mummies and sanitation down to two per tree. Is so we're impacting all of these reasons that navel orgrim gets lower instead of just shaking a tree and saying, hey, you know, we reduce the numbers. Okay? That's why this threshold of two per tree is so important. Now, the second topic here is mating disruption. A lot of work's been done here. We know it's effective. We know the results are predictable. So this is work that was funded by DPR and by the Almond Board, um, just summarizing um, three years and, in some cases, six years' worth of data. This damage, uh, damage reductions are real. 50% is kind of on average. If you're up in larger acreage plots, it can be higher than that, uh, and you can see the differences here. But the key thing for me with the main disruption is when all the economics were run. So they showed that main disruption is affordable. So the break-even points, 1%. So I can tell you, if you did not use main disruption this year and you had more than 1% damage, you would have more money in your pocket right now if you had invested in main disruption than by not investing. Okay? So your returns would have been greater than your investment. So that's why I mentioned early on, um, you know, a lot of people say that they look at it as what it costs. But when you look at it as an investment and what you're getting back from it, that's where it makes a lot of sense to use it. Um, I know that's difficult when you're in a year where you're trying to cut every cost possible, but the risk of omitting that cost and not gaining the returns from it can be much, uh, much more devastating. Um, and then I want to just make one little point on damage. I have a lot of people I'll talk to, they'll say, you know, I had 4% USDA damage, and they equate that to I lost 4%. And that's not the case. So a little bit of back of the napkin math here. You know, if you have 4% damage in your USDA, you're not getting paid for that 4%. But there's another 4% typically that was left in the field. Okay, so blowouts, or they got obliterated in the hulling shelling process. Typically, windrow damage levels are twice the USDA damage. Okay, so 4% on your grade, Add the 4% in the field that's not showing up, you're already up to 8. And if you go, let's say, up to 4% damage compared to something else, and you lose, let's say, 8 cents in bonuses. Sorry, that shouldn't say 8%. That should say 8 cents in bonuses. Um, or, sorry, eight, or sorry, 12 cents on $1.60. That's an 8% loss in bonuses paid on all of your crop that gets paid. So when you add all that up, a 4% on your grade sheet, is something more like 15 or 16% less money in your pocket. That's why the economics of investing in naval orange room are so huge, is because these losses are much bigger than what shows up just on that USDA sheet. So main disruption, uh, my summary here, should be seen more as an investment than as an expense. So a third topic is insecticides, our third pillar. And in a normal year, we get this synchronized hull split early July that's right at the start of the second flight. We'll spray at that timing in a couple weeks later. Uh, beautiful system, works fairly well. Well, what did we get in 2023? We got this really long bloom that led to a, uh, you know, a hull split that was not synchronized. No matter how much water you pulled, okay, it, just, it didn't all come at once. It didn't come at the 4th of July. It came in mid-July, at least in, you know, I'm speaking from a South Valley perspective. 
It wasn't synchronized with the start of the second flight. And all the timings were messed up. Um, in fact, when the hull split came, it was kind of in the middle of the flight instead of at the start of the flight. Uh, a lot of growers called me about the 4th of July and said, David, I'm ready to do my hull split spray, but the flight hasn't started, and my nuts aren't even close to starting to split. What do I do? Like, oh, well, that's easy. Wait a week. They said, well, yeah, I already tried that. I called the applicator, and they said, a week from now, they're 100% booked up with everyone else's hull split sprays. They don't have a window for me. What do I do? It's like, I don't know. I'm a scientist. I know the worms. I can't help with the logistics. Um, but that was a real struggle by growers that they just, you know, trying to navigate the best timing um, with, with everything out of whack. This one is just Mother Nature uh, through a, a huge curveball. And then the fourth topic here is timely harvest. And the way I want to explain this is through two case scenarios. Okay? So when I say timely harvest, here's what I mean, I'm, uh, the definition. That means harvesting nonpareils before uh, the third flight starts. Because in that case, most, so you've got your second flight. Most of the worms during the month of July are in the nonpareils. So if you're able to shake your nonpareils, get them piled and fumigated before any of those worms become adults, there's no influence of the third flight on the nonpareils, and you're essentially removing the third flight from the field before it becomes the third flight. If 99% of those nonpareils get, you know, get uh, fumigated before those worms become adults, you got 99% control of those worms. I'll tell you, that's way better than two insecticides. Okay? That's a huge, huge, huge benefit in a management program. What happens if you have a not timely system? All of the worms in the nonpareils, which this year was, was above normal, all emerge. They all become the third flight. They lay eggs back on your nonpareils. That becomes your, your pinhole damage. And they lay eggs in your pollinators. So your pollinators are all above normal to start with in the month of August. And then if you don't get those pollinators off before that generation completes, you know, let's say in the middle of September, you now have an even greater fourth flight that's reinfesting your pollinators. So if you had Monterey's, okay, if you had Monterey's with double-digit damage, this is what happened here. Um, so basically, you know, what kind of year do we have in 2023? We had the latter, okay? I don't know anybody that harvested nonpareils before the third flight got going, and I don't know anyone that harvested monorays before the full brunt of the fourth flight hit them. Um, essentially a nightmare scenario, again, Mother Nature, causing your crop to be a week, two weeks. Um, like, I did see people picking up nuts in November. <laughs> Just crazy. I would have never said that's possible, but it happened. So. So putting this all together, you know, what happened with the four pillars of naval orange management? Um, they all were deficient compared to a normal year. Um, some of that was, let's call it, fault of growers trying to respond to projected prices. A lot of that was mother nature. But I do want to say that I thought a lot of that was an anomaly. I don't think it's a, a trend. I think it was a blip. So what do we do, you know, what do, we do in the future? To me, it's easy. Stay the course. Okay? A lot of work has gone into the program. The program is still viable. It's still the best option. So winter sanitation, do it. Okay? Reset the clock. Two per tree is the threshold. Make sure they get destroyed. Where are we right now compared to one year ago? I'll tell you, the percentage of mummies infested with worms is correlated to how much damage you had the previous year. Okay, so right now you not only have mummies, but you have a higher percentage of those mummies that are infested than you do in a normal year. So sanitation, got to get those off the tree, got to get them out of the system to reset the clock. Otherwise, 2023 is going to carry over to 2024. Second thing with main disruption, view it as an investment. Um, any of you that have seen me give talks, you know I'm an advocate. Four companies with good products. Um, Talk to them, you know, they're here at the conference, um, invest. Insecticides, again, 2023 was an anomaly. Um, you know, stay the course, use the degree day models. Uh, I'm hoping that next year the second flight starts right at the start of hull split and that everyone sprays that they've been doing for 10 years 
are timed again properly. Um, I, I have to hope that we'll get back to the long-term average next year instead of the one-year blip. And then likewise, timely harvest. You know, if, if you harvest your nonpareils on August 15th and you've done that every year for the last nine years, except for 2023, let's hope that 2024 goes back to what you did for the previous nine years uh, because the timely harvest trumps all. Okay, I'll tell you, if, if you do everything wrong but get your nuts off early enough, you're going to come through okay. But if you do everything right and your Monterey's are seen in the field until the last week of October, no matter what you do, you're going to have problems. So focusing on getting those nuts off the day they're ready as fast as you can to the best of your, your capacity with equipment and so on. So with that, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, 15 minute summary, in and out, that was pretty fast, sports center-ish. Um, but I think the principles were captured there. And you know, hopefully thinking about how to integrate those four is gonna get us back on track next year to where we've been uh, over the long term. Thank you. Thank you for the recap, David. I was just reminiscing on Hurricane Hillary as you went through that. And yep. <laughs> Had the nonpareil delayed for two weeks in the south part of the state. That was that was a, a, a twist for me for mm -hmm. sure. Um, yeah, and nonpareil in October getting shake. <laughs> that was a first as well. So, yeah. um, so our next speaker is uh, Mel Machado. And uh, Mel, just some some ideas to think about in your talk. Uh, what kind of damage occurred throughout the valley? There's probably other than just naval orange worm. And uh, were our control me measures worth it? So with that, up mill. There was all sorts of damage, but we're going to focus on naval orange room today. For those of you that missed the plant bug talk yesterday, yeah, that was out there too, and it was about the same. Um, I'm going to rinse and repeat a few of the things that David talked about, but I'm going to add some different, different information to it as well and, and some visuals to go with it. But I have to say this. Somebody has to do this. It's not a naval orange room discussion if we don't honor Bob Curtis. <laughs> Dead serious. You started this. <laughs> okay. So, Bob, you, what, your master's thesis was naval orange room? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's all his fault. No. <laughs> okay. So. He would have just fixed it. If you just fixed it then, ago. Bob. <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear that, I, I'm a data geek. I keep all this data, but I didn't have anything back into the 70s, and Gabrielle says, Bob's got some numbers. Bob, how bad was it? Okay, keep in mind, my average right now on all the varieties as of uh, last Friday, last time I looked, was about 3.5%. Seven, no. 8.8% average in 1978. What the heck did that look like? Okay, so uh, let me throw this up there. F forget the funny numbers that are up there, okay? Look at the colors. So for those of you that are blue diamond, you understand our grading process in non pearl meats. There's Q+, plus, Q1, 2, 3, and in standard. In non pearl meats, you, if you're 2.1 or higher percent rejects, you're standard. And the way I describe it is you fell off the bottom of the page. You failed to make grade because the money is really in the high quality program. Okay, so the red bars there, that's the standard. And it gives you an idea back to 2017, which 2017 I described as the wreck, because there are people that had dealt with high rejects in 17 that they'd never experienced any on year, any year prior. Okay, so this is the Sacramento Valley, and they've had some issues up there with cropping. And you can see how bad, how, how tall that red bar is, that red column is this year. Now, what's it mean financially? At a Q plus category, you're about 17 cents in premiums. Okay, just the premiums. Okay, in the standard category, you're about a penny. So it's a huge difference here. So this is Sacramento Valley. Here's the Northern San Joaquin, which is San Joaquin, Stanislaus, and Merced. And you notice the, the bars are a little lower. Okay, you're still looking at that 17 cents or so to maybe two cents, one or two cents in the standard. Here's the Southern San Joaquin. Yeah, the wreck we had down there. Okay, and this is meat, so we're not even talking about Hurricane Hillary and the mold issues on InShell. That's, that's not part of this discussion. Okay, now, InShell. Okay, InShell, the first thing you notice, those, those bars are, are lower. And the reason for that is the field staff, and there's a few of the field staff members here at Blue Diamond in the audience, they work really hard at roguing the InShell, at keeping the worst of the worst out of the InShell program, because, quite frankly, if you're 4 or 5% on a field grade, 
you send it to a good shelter, he could probably get that down below too and get you into the high, high quality categories. So we try to keep the worst of the stuff out of the inshow program so it looks better. So you're up there 18, 19, 20 cents as a Q1 category. By the way, the quality program for inshell is a standard of 3%, not 2. It's a little more liberal. Here's the central region again, northern San Joaquin. And in the south, yeah, they had problems in the south again. And that's not that unusual for them to happen. Okay, so if 2017 was a wreck, this one's the meltdown. This was literally a meltdown of what we had. And I call it an amphibious assault or aerial assault of, of Naval Orange Room coming into the valley. So looking at the other end of the spectrum, Monterey, the Sacramento Valley. Again, how high are those bars? Okay, what proportion? Okay, was in this category. So you see Monterey did pretty well in, in the, the best category, what we call a Q4 in, in pollinator varieties, at about 11, 12 cents okay, versus 2 cents for a standard. And in the southern San Joaquin, again, they get mugged on a, a regular basis down there with Naval Orange Room. So I'm going to apologize for the eye chart. It is truly eye chart. First thing I want to acknowledge is that there's an error at the top of what says uh, value per TGM there, the second from the right column. That first row should be $1.78.5, not $1.73. I was messing with the spreadsheet, and I sent the wrong version, but that's the only error on it. Uh, to address this idea of economics, I'm going to describe this to you. This thing looks at reject levels in 1% increments, and some of you have seen this before. I took it down to 10%. This year, I took it to 20% because that's just acknowledging what we had. So at 20% reject, this is 1% increments, okay? And this is saying, all right, the state average crop, if it is a 2.6 crop, is about 1,900 pounds. And no, I'm not telegraphing the non pro price at all, but I'm saying for that miserable price that nobody likes and everybody kind of worked into their budgets of about a buck 60, okay? At, and acknowledging the reject levels, your, your reject weight that comes off the statement Okay, is in that first column I just highlighted. And then as David said, the next one is that Scheller loss. So I'm acknowledging you, whatever you have in your statement, if you're 2% of your statement, you were 4 coming out of the field. Because the gravity decks and, and the aspiration and now the color sorters are going to clean a lot of that stuff out. So it's, it's double, and some will say it's at least double what you see in your statement. Okay, so what's this boil down to? Let me, uh, is this working now? Suddenly it's not, oh, here we go, excuse me, it is working. So what happens here, that, that first circle, that's at 5%. At 5% rejects, it costs you $491 per acre at 1,900 pounds at $1.60 a pound. Remember, rejects are the gift to keep taking. Okay? And it's not just the premium loss, it's the weight loss, as David so aptly pointed out. That matters. At 10%, $877. And at 20 $1,594 an acre is gone. So I'm going to ask this, how many in here by show of hands are actually growers? Come on, don't be bashful. All right, put them down. How many of you guys sprayed three times? Keep them up if you wish you hadn't. <laughs> yeah, a little different crowd than I had at Blue Diamond a few weeks ago. How many of you sprayed three times and wish you'd have sprayed fourth? And yeah, nobody wanted to take that plunge. But I see a head going up and down going, yeah, I'm not going to tell everybody, but yeah. You know, that's, that was the thing that went on here this year. It was really a challenge. So, yes, sanitation was an issue. There's no doubt about that. Some of these fields, like they had, hadn't even been shook, okay? That prolonged bloom, it was really interesting bloom, and it's not unusual to see in the hills on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley differences between the top of the hills and the bottom of the hills. But this year was really strange, and it went on for a long time, and it, it got very, very interesting to watch these things and you know, what's going to happen here. And then there's this, and kudos to Lick Millerin for sending this around a couple of years ago in a whole different discussion of when would you shake. And uh, it's kind of fun for a whole bunch of independence growers going, well, hell, I have all those stages at one time in my trees. And this year, in my little nonpareil Bennett, I had all those stages, too, on a fifth leaf. When do you shake? Now, what does it mean besides, what's well, going to take me forever to get these things out of these trees? What am I going to do? It also means you are producing new, susceptible, attractive material to the moths continuously for about three weeks this year. Okay? In my block, I had stuff on the end of the branch that was dry and falling off, and stuff in the middle of the tree that wasn't even smiling on a fifth leaf tree. How do you protect against that? And so the challenges that David enumerated here, that, that's what you're looking at. And then there's the poor grower decisions. And we're going to come back to this one. You know, poor grower decisions. They were justifiable, but you know, how much did that cost savings cost you ultimately? And so here's the other question. What, what about the guy that sprayed once and he's 1%? And a guy a mile away who sprayed three times and disrupted and he's 15 to 20%. Wow. And we had that happen this year. It, it made no sense. But here's the other thing. 
that neighborhood influence. This moth will fly for miles, and this year the unprecedented number of abandoned orchards waiting for the removal outfit to come in and blow those trees over. And now in December, I'm looking at some of these orchards still standing, and I'm thinking, no, they're not waiting for anything. They just walked away. How do we abate this? What do we do? Because those things pumped out the moths. You add that to the neighbor who cut some corners, and you did it all, and you got mugged. Here's that aerial assault coming over the horizon. How do you do this? How do you fight against this? So, oops, I went too fast. And I don't know if will this work. Whoever is controlling the computer, and you make that work, click on that video. Please. This isn't a good presentation if that thing doesn't work. There you go. I had one video from back in 2017. I could find this in many places around the valley. Those are barn swallows working the stockpile. That is a pile of wood colony. And we sat there and cracked up nuts. It was about 20% in the pile. And you could find these things around the area. Starlings, pigeons, swallows, feasting. The joke was, let's cut one of the little buggers open and see how many worms he's got in it, or how many moths he's got in it. They were, it was just a feast. And I looked down and there were moths on my legs. They were coming out of that pile. So, oops, yep, okay, here we go. So a load comes in, this is typical, comes in, hits our receiving station. We do a quick test merely for, for storage purposes. It has nothing to do with grower payment. Wanted to keep the best of the best away from the worst of the worst. And you break it out and that stuff on the right was all reject material, about a third of it. Oops, what do you do with this kind of stuff? And my concern has been not how bad is the average because averages hide things. My concern is how big is the bad pile and how bad is it? And I can safely say in this industry, there are tens of millions of pounds of almonds out there that are between 10 and 20% rejects, okay? Because I know I've got some, and I'm just a fraction of the industry. So, come on. And the idea of that aerial assault, okay, if you turn that left nut over, you'd find there were six pinholes in it. How many eggs were laid on that poor thing? That's the kind of assault that we face this year. One of my favorites, the dark spot at the top, that's the shade of the bin. This was a set of doubles and three bins, the end run that came in of in-shell. Notice the moths. I sent it immediately to be shelled out. The night crew did it. The shellerman tells me they lost their minds because they threw out half of it. This is what I fished out of the shell pile, and it still came in at over 20% rejects. This is the value that was, was lost and cost to growers this year. So... Neighbors matter in this business, and I, I love this. One time in my career, I've asked a group of growers, who's got a crappy neighbor and nobody moved? Some of you were in that room, and I said, what, you're trying, you don't want to out the guy? Come on. Everybody had a crappy neighbor this year. You know, it mattered, okay? Uh, these abandoned orchards, okay? There were challenges and decisions made that went horribly awry, and sometimes they worked well. The reduced inputs thing definitely played a role, and I say, how much did that cost savings cost you, Okay? There are the guys that disrupted three hull split sprays and they still got hammered. You know, what do you do about it? How do I look a guy of that in, in the face and say, okay, here's what happened to you? So we physically overpowered our ability to control this little thing. That's, that's my opinion. So what do we do? Okay, carrying on with David, we've got to reduce the inoculum. We've got to reduce the amount of mods out there. And you've all heard the saying that we're behind the eight ball. We're behind the bowling ball right now. Okay, with the mummy load that's out there, and the infestation rate that's out there, we've got to do something to cut that inoculum down. I'm one of the guys that believes, and I'll use the word believe here, that everything we do to mitigate navel orange worm is just trying to make that last whole split treatment actually effective or more effective. So if I start here with a population, and my spray might take out half, if I cut it in half, I still got too many. I want to reduce that inoculum with everything I do to get that inoculum down to where the actual treatment works. Okay, so I've got to reduce the inoculum. You've got to start with sanitation. Thank you, David. We've got to do something about these abandoned orchards. And I've got some ideas. The citrus guys are facing some problems with orchards with greening. I need to talk to some of the citrus guys because they need to abate those. Is there something we can do with this as well? Okay, disruption. I absolutely believe in it. It can work. And it can work in smaller blocks as well. So, Jesse Roseman, bless his heart, is a result of me on an angry rant one day to created a program where we call it the Neighborhood Mating Disruption Program. This is a website that's active. It's called agneighbors.com. Identify your parcel. And what you're saying is, I'm disrupting or I'm interested in disrupting. And then you'll be notified when we put together a, enough contiguous acres that will be viable for disruption that you and your neighbors are interested in playing with each other. Go forth and disrupt. 
We're agnostic on the tools. There's NRCS funds out there to help you with that, that additional cost, but we want to make this spread even to the smaller blocks. Okay? Uh, there is a question about reporting. Okay? Uh, as we went through this data, I really believe a lot of disruption out there is not reported. And if it has an EPA registration number, it should be reported, and it's not. So the data here, being a data geek, it drives me kind of crazy. You, you, you can't get good information as far as actually what's being out there and disrupted. Okay, so coverage, proper application technique. I'm a jerk when it comes to coverage. Okay, you got to get the coverage, okay? It's a matter of timing. It's a matter of watching the tops of the trees. The blanks split at the tops first. For crying out loud, watch them. They're about two weeks ahead of the sound nuts, okay? By the way, that I mentioned coverage, okay? So, uh, also, aerial application. Okay, you're a grower, aerial application. That's stupid. You're not gonna get more than six feet in that canopy. That's the six feet you're not reaching from the ground. And if you copy that link on YouTube, Doug Teal down at Chowchilla, the, the aerial applicator down there, I would never call him a crop duster. Dave, are you in the room? Dave's brother, Doug's brother. Uh, he did a, a good YouTube segment on aerial application in almond orchards. It's worth looking at. It's worth watching. So take your pictures of that and take a look at that video. All right. So this is the setup. Whoever's in the back, I'm going to need you to make this video run for me. I'm not complaining about the spray job. This is my own personal orchard. It's a fifth leaf non pearl Bennett. Notice the spray going over the top. It's a setup because it matters in the next video, okay? And I'm not griping about it. I will note it's an electrostatic sprayer. And for those of you that think that droplet comes out of the manifold and goes, <coughs> a tree, and you can see right now it doesn't work that way, okay? So just notice the amount coming over the top. We'll go to the next one. Okay, make that one run. Same orchard, just the other side. And again, ignore the amount going over the top. For those of you who think every other row is a good thing, watch how much movement you're getting on the far side of the tree. And what I want to get is a fully mature orchard doing this over the top. And I, I had no motives when I shot this video. It's, I got a drone and I'm having fun. And when I got on the laptop and went, ooh, there's a lesson there. You're not getting that much movement through that canopy on the far side of that tree. Now, there's people that believe in every other row. My own stepson, Mel, we sprayed one and a half times and it worked great. You got lucky. So I just outed my stepson and we have fun discussions about this. <laughs> but I look at this and I say, in general, and here's what I have to do. I'm a generalist. I have to speak in generalities and I am not going to allow you an opportunity to stick a screwdriver into my logic and pry your way out of it. I'm going to say every year the road doesn't work, okay, based on what you're seeing there. Um, okay. So. Just to carry that thought forward, yeah, poor sorry anemic tree, that's my non -parel. Okay, we don't grow trees with scaffolds like this anymore, or four, we're growing bushes. And I'm out there after harvest going, okay, that's kind of cool. You know, much of the leaves are off, that gives you an idea what that structure's like. Put those leaves back on, grow that tree to about 10 years old, and try to shove spray through that thing every other row. It doesn't work. Okay, so you can see what goes on here. So, early harvest, okay. Thank you, David, for taking the word early out and putting timely. I've growled enough of the UC guys about that. And I want to say why here. Yes, it does stop that succeeding generation. I do question about the idea of, of no attraction to uh, the nuts on the ground. Because like in this case, the worst case, you've got stuff that's green on the ground. It's got to be throwing our aromatics out there that are attractive to that moth. And if there's nothing to the tree, you'd think that there would be some attraction of the nuts in the ground. But I'm, I'm spewing. I'm speculating at this point. I don't know that that's a fact. I'm just asking the question. Because you have a pollinator full of nuts also. Yeah, you've got the pollinators yeah. up there too. So notice the question marks. I'm just, I'm speculating, okay? That's a question I've never satisfied in my mind. But if you're going to do early harvest, you better have your ant control program lined up because they're going to be in the ground for a while. If not, okay, the issues of stockpiles, this is what happens. So I'm going to grant here that the best practices is developed by research conducted by the university, funded by the Almond Board, says use white on black plastic. I hate it because you can't see the condensation. You get good temperature control, but you can't see the condensation. If you get closer to that thing, it's raining in that pile. So I, I'm known for driving through stockpile yards and looking at hauler managers going, vent those piles, get that moisture out, because here's the worst case. That's 40,000 meat pounds that the grower drove in, unloaded it, that hauler has white and black, they threw it over, and if you can see it, the little white things way at the back pile, those are mushrooms. <laughs> I pulled mushrooms six inches long out of that pile, and where the plastic dipped down, it was literally raining. Take a shovel in there, there was wet nuts, wet nuts, two feet deep 
in that pile. So this is what can happen if you don't it, work that timely harvest correct. And then there's this. Nobody said the C word. So Lauren sends me these pictures. Hey, Mel, what's this? What the hell are you talking about? She said, well, people think it's ants. No, that's not yeah. ants. Said, what are you talking about, Lauren? That's naval orange room. She goes, look again. That's Carpophilus beetle. Who in here has heard of Carpophilus beetle? Very few. Yeah, I'm actually I'm proud a lot of people have. That's a new critter we've got to worry about. And what's the best method of control at this point appears to be sanitation. Okay, and the Australians are fighting this. So I just had to throw that out there. There's naval orange room with that little crescent shape behind the head capsule. You don't have that on Carpophilus. So with that, I'm done. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mel. Um, our next speaker, Tim uh, Birmingham, will be speaking about uh, uh, aflatoxins, I believe. And uh, some questions for you, Tim. Uh, uh, what happens at the foreign ports when we get uh, loads rejected, or do they get rejected if they find uh, above threshold levels? And, uh, and how much does the moisture affect aflatoxins? We had a wet year with a lot of worm. Does that play a role? So with that, Tim Birmingham. OK, thank you. And a couple of really good presentations that will feed nicely into what I'm going to talk about. I am going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the relationship with insect damage and navel orange worm with aflatoxin and why that's important to the industry. Um, obviously, there's, there's quality issues associated with insect damage, but aflatoxin is something that the handlers grapple with. And as we see higher levels of insect damage, um, we expect to see uh, more issues, and especially in foreign ports, with uh, lots being rejected. All right, so um, we, we had a good understanding of, of kind of the life cycle of, of naval orange worm and how that, that, that plays in with um, extra flights, you know, potentially causing, um, you know, damage to the nuts. But those extra flights can also carry mold to, uh, to those nuts um, and create issues with aflatoxin. Uh, aflatoxin is, is actually a, a contaminant. It's produced by two different mold species. You have Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus parasiticus. Um, these are common molds that are found in almond orchards. Um, the, the navel orange worm moth can actually carry the mold to the nuts. The navel orange worm larvae can actually uh, feed on the nuts and actually um, create little microclimates which allow the mold to grow and produce um, the aflatoxin. Uh, aflatoxin is widely re regulated around the world. There's different limits for different markets. Uh, in the U.S., the limit for aflatoxin is 20 part per billion, but one of our major markets, the EU, as well as Japan, have tighter tolerances for aflatoxin. Uh, 10 part per billion uh, total aflatoxin, and they've also set a limit for B1, um, which is a form of aflatoxin, at 8 part per billion. So they have tighter, tighter limits for aflatoxin in those markets. Um, and aflatoxin, it's hard to detect. Um, when you look at a part per billion, it's really equivalent um, to, you know, one drop in an Olympic-sized pool um, or a pinch of salt in a 10-ton in a bag of potato chips. So it's really a small measure of unit. And as I'll show you here in a minute, that one of the challenges with aflatoxin once it gets into the product stream is that it, it's not homogeneous. It's not uniformly mixed in that lot. You can have literally hot pockets, you know, that, that needle in a haystack that makes detection really, really difficult. Uh, so I think that the presenters did a great job of really kind of showing, um, you know, how navel orange worm um, levels can increase uh, in the orchard. Um, and as I just mentioned, they can actually, you know, cause the problems with aflatoxin by transferring the mold throughout the orchard. You have the moths that, that carry the mold, um, and then you have the actual larvae themselves that can carry um, the mold spores on their little appendages, and then when they start to grow and feed on the nuts, um, they can actually carry that mold and allow that mold to grow and produce the aflatoxin. Um, so we heard a lot about winter sanitation. From a quality standpoint, it's really important. From an aflatoxin control standpoint, it's also a really important, important strategy. All right, so what do we know about the correlation between insect damage and aflatoxin? We've done a lot of studies looking at this. This is an example of a study looking at 50 different lots. And really, where do we find the aflatoxin? If you look at the, the, the study here, um, the insect damage, so if we took the weight of, of the insect damage fraction, that constituted 7.2% of the weight from all of these 50 lots, but it, it amounted to 76.3% of the aflatoxin mass. Now, this is telling us that the majority of the aflatoxin we find is indeed going to be in those, those insect damage nuts. 
We also find aflatoxin in other uh, fractions as well, other quality factors. So uh, we find it in the other defects of the gummy, the shrivel, uh, the brown spot. Obviously mold, you're, if you have moldy nuts, um, there's a good chance you can find aflatoxin as well. Uh, we also find it in mechanical damage, so chip and scratch. There's a, um, there's a transfer mechanism that happens probably from the insect damage, contaminated nuts onto uh, those nuts in which the brown skin has been um, scraped off the surface. You know, again, once you disrupt the surface of the nut, um, you can create you know, different little microclimates which can you know, allow the mold to grow or potentially um, the, the cross-contamination with the aflatoxin. All right, so um, you know, what are some of the things that the handlers can do? Um, you know, obviously, you know, from this last study I just showed you, if we know that aflatoxin is concentrated in the insect damage, you can do some things with trying to sort out that insect damage to lower the level of aflatoxin in your crop or in your product. Um, so we've done studies looking at this as well. This is an example of a, a, a study that we did looking at a low level of aflatoxin in the incoming lot. So it was 2.9 part per billion nanograms per gram. You know, so really a low level. Um, but what happens when you start to remove the serious damage, the insect damage from this lot? Um, so the first stage here is we pulled out, um, I, I think this was about 20 pounds of product that we pulled out through laser sorting. We're able to show concentration of aflatoxin just by removing the serious damage. That fraction was concentrated to about 30 part per billion, 29.1 nanograms per gram. Uh, and that lowered the accept stream level of aflatoxin from 2.9 to 2.1 part per billion. Um, so, you know, low levels to begin with, but we're still able to, to pull out some serious damage and show a concentration in that serious damage fraction. We then took that accept stream, we subjected it to additional sorting, so hand sorting, um, and we're able to pull out um, even more um, product and show a concentration um, of, of aflatoxin at 40.3 part per billion. Um, in that insect damage fraction that we pulled out through hand sorting. And that lowered the overall level of aflatoxin in this lot to 1.5 part per billion. So this is just an example of, of what you can do with sorting. Um, we know this is very effective. We see lots that, that are failed for aflatoxin at higher levels. You can run them through this sort of sorting. We call it reconditioning, pull out the serious damage, and that will indeed lower the level of aflatoxin in the finished product stream. So this is a, a very effective way to reduce the level of aflatoxin in a lot. Um, the other thing that, that handlers can do, and, and they, they do this um, quite a bit, is they can test for aflatoxin in a lot. Now the challenge with this is that, as I mentioned, aflatoxin isn't uniformly distributed within that lot. Um, so if you see on the left, this is an example of, of kind of how a non-homogeneous uh, mixture would look like. You might have pockets um, of, of concentrated aflatoxin in certain areas of the lot. If it was homogeneous, if it looked more like the, um, the container on the right-hand side, it would be much more easy to sample that lot and ensure that that sample represents the entire lot. But that's not the case at all with aflatoxin. It truly is that needle in a haystack. Um, the, the little pile of almonds there, uh, the numbers above those almonds, this reflects um, a study that we did looking at level of aflatoxin in a lot that we sampled multiple times. So each one of those numbers reflects the result of a sample from that lot. And you can see we had a wide range of aflatoxin um, levels. These are 10 kilogram samples we pulled from the lot. I think there's 16 different numbers there. Um, but they range from basically no detect, zero part per billion, all the way up to 99 part per billion. Um, and this very clearly demonstrates the, um, the non-homogeneous uh, mixture that we're dealing with. And we sampled the heck out of it, you know, multiple times, and we're finding different levels every time. Um, so how do you get around this? Well, you really need to take a big sample when you're testing for aflatoxin. And um, the handlers do this, um, and I'm going to show you here some, some PEC data for the pre-expert check program. Um, but basically, all the consignments that are shipped to Europe, handlers have the option to participate in a program that's called the pre-export check, where the EU has recognized that if we sample here in the, in the U.S., they will test at a reduced frequency in the EU. But the handlers spend a lot of time, effort, and money sampling that product. Um, and they pull a very large sample to try to make sure that they're, they're finding that hot pocket so that they can hold that lot back here before they actually ship it. So under that PEC program, what they do is they pull a 20 kilogram sample. Um, and it's not just one 20 kilogram sample from one tote. They pull incremental samples from throughout the lot. Um, and they can do this either if they're processing in line, they can pull samples as they go. 
um, or if they're doing finished product sampling, they'll actually probe um, you know, 20 different bins. They'll pull 22 incremental samples, at about 900 grams each. So that's a lot of product that they sample. Um, this product is, is, is tested. It's destroyed. So when they pull that out of a lot, um, they're grinding that up, or they're splitting it into two samples. They grind it up, and then they analyze each subsample. Um, that product is destroyed in the testing process. Um, under the PEC program, so what you see here in this chart, um, on the left-hand y-axis there, you can see that the numbers, those represent the lots tested. The blue bars represent the number of lots tested by year under the PEC program. On average, we're testing about 15,000 lots. It varies from year to year. Uh, we peaked in, in 2020. I think we were you know, close to 18,000 lots tested. It's come down the last couple years, and it's rising again. Uh, the gold bars reflect the number of lots that are actually accepted. Um, so with the pre-export check program, we hold a certain number of lots back um, that fail. You know, when the lot fails, it has to be either reconditioned or, or it goes to another market that has a, um, has a uh, looser tolerance. Um, the orange line here on this graph r reflects the failure rate. And so these are the lots that fail here upon testing in the U.S. under the PEC program. And a couple things I want to want to point out here. This failure rate really mimics the level of insect damage um, that you see in the crop. And so that little graph on the upper right-hand side, that's the insect damage by crop year. Uh, if you look back to 2017, what do you see? You see an orange bar that reflects a reject rate here in the U.S. of about 6.5%. Six, six what happened in 2017, we had higher levels of aflatoxin damage. We came out of a, a really wet year. Um, maybe the growers weren't able to do some of their winter sanitation practices, and so insect damage climbed. Um, and that translated to higher, higher levels of aflatoxin in the crop. We're seeing a very similar situation here um, this year with the crop. Um, we're still, you know, we still don't have a lot of um, new crop that we've tested under the PEC program, so we're still dealing with some of the older product. Um, but the newer level of product that we're seeing, we are seeing reject rates that are approaching 6% um, here in the U.S., and I expect that's going to climb um, quite a bit as well. So I just want, want you to keep that in mind. So we're holding, the handlers are holding more product back. Um, if you have a 6% reject rate uh, and you're shipping 15,000 lots, um, that's 900 lots, you know, maybe, maybe 1,000 lots that are being held back that now the handlers have to go back and try to either resort or find another market for. You know, again, they're spending a lot of time, effort, and money to them um, to try to clean that product up. So what are the options? You know, what happens now um, if you do indeed ship product? Um, well, when you ship product under the PEC program to Europe, there still is a chance that that product can be tested. So I mentioned the, the PEC program specifies that if you test the product in the U.S., the EU has agreed to test it at a reduced frequency, but they still will test product. Um, and we still do re see, re see rejections in the EU and other markets just because of that random distribution of aflatoxin in the lot. You can test it here, you can screen product here, you can hold back bad product, but you, in some cases you're still going to send product that has levels of aflatoxin higher than the, the um, accept limit in that country. Or it may be the case that they truly found that needle in the haystack when they test in, in that foreign market. Uh, so the first graph that you see on the right is the number of rejections that we've seen by year in two of our um, main, main markets that really look at heav heavily at aflatoxin. That would be the EU. Um, and, and Japan. And so the EU would be reflected by the blue bars that you see there, and Japan would be the, uh, the orange bars. Um, Japan tests every single consignment that comes into their country. And so that's why we see more rejections in Japan, even though we're shipping fewer consignments to J Japan than we are to the EU. It's because every single lot is tested. Um, and as you test more, you know, you're going to find it more just because, again, it's not homogeneously mixed throughout the lot. Um, and so this is a little bit of a challenge for the industry. We are working with Japan to see if they will back off of that 100% testing requirement, um, but it's a slow-moving process. So at this point, you know, handlers still test the product here in the U.S., but we still expect to see, um, you know, rejections in, in these foreign markets. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, with the insect damage where it's at now, I expect these numbers to continue to climb this year. The good thing is that, you know, when we look at the PEC data, what we can see is that handlers are really doing a good job of keeping the average level of aflatoxin in the lots tested low. We're still shipping low levels over to these countries, but we still will see, see rejections. Um, and so if we look at, you know, kind of where we're at on the rejections at this point in time, 
Uh, we are seeing an increase in rejections. We're, we're at over 40 rejections this, this year in 2023 for Japan and the EU combined. Um, I think we're at about 25 in Japan and just at around 20 in the EU. Um, those numbers will probably still continue to climb a little bit, and I'd expect um, going into next year we're going to see um, more rejections as well, just given the level of insect damage. And what happens um, in, in markets when, when you have a rejected lot? Um, in Japan, there's really no option other than to bring that product back. Uh, Japan doesn't allow any reconditioning at this point. That's something that in the next um, you know, few years we're hopeful for, maybe sooner, that Japan will allow product to be reconditioned so it doesn't have to be you know, loaded back up on a container and shipped back. That's very costly. Uh, it takes time. You, know, you have degradation to the product, possible infestations that can happen. So that, that's a big concern that um, we're working with the Japanese authorities to see if we can get reconditioning in place. Uh, in Europe, the options are you know, essentially to try to divert it to another market. Um, there is the option to actually recondition in Europe. You know, if you can find a, a company, there's a, a company in um, Synergy in the Netherlands that will actually do reconditioning, um, but it's a, it's a process to get the authorities from the port at which it's rejected to allow that to happen. But it can happen. Uh, you can send the product there and they can actually clean that product up. They can run it through reconditioning to remove serious damage. Um, the other option, and the most widely used option, is to send that product back to the, to the U.S. Most of this product that does indeed fail does indeed come back. Um, and then the challenge really is how do, you, how do you deal with the FDA? FDA treats all of this product that comes back into the U.S. as, as basically foreign imports coming into the country. Um, so they don't treat it as U.S. domestic product that has gone out and then come back. They, they treat it as any other import that comes into the U.S. And so it's under full scrutiny um, by FDA. And if it did indeed fail in a foreign country at greater than 20 part per billion, there's a, a pretty lengthy process to get reviewed and approved um, by FDA to allow reconditioning so that product can come back into the country. We are also working with the USDA on a, on a proposal which would streamline this process, and we, um, we have some good traction with the FDA. We're hopeful that, um, that, that we'll be able to add almonds to an MOU that's already in place between USDA and FDA allowing um, um, oversight by USDA for this goods return process. That would allow us to basically leverage what we're already doing under PEC to really streamline the goods return process into the U.S. Um, the other option for this product um, is to destroy it. And so if the levels of aflatoxin are so high, um, there is the potential that the, company, or the country in which it's rejected may not allow it to be returned um, to the, or to the country it came from. They may require that it be destroyed. Uh, and then also, if it comes back to the U.S., the FDA could potentially require that that product be destroyed if they don't believe that product can be reconditioned. Um, I'm not aware of that happening. Um, you know, in most cases, you can get that product um, you know, brought back into the U.S. with FDA clearing it after reconditioning has happened. So I think that's all I have. Oh, um, yeah, so, so bringing it back to the U.S., the um, main goal is to try to get it back as quickly as possible. You know, again, if product's rejected um, in Europe, for instance, and it's sat out in the port for quite a while, you can have infestation issues. So it's always a concern um, what's happening to that product while it's sitting there. But you want to get it back. You need to get it fumigated. Um, working with the FDA, it's a little bit of a process, but we can help, um, we can help the handlers through that process with making sure they can submit a plan that has been, um, has been vetted with the FDA as far as the steps that are required for uh, reconditioning. Um, FDA is going to issue a, re a detention notice in most cases. Very rarely they'll allow product to come back in and not require any reconditioning. Um, that has happened. If it's failed, let's say in Japan or the EU at 12 part per billion um, and it's come back into the U.S., the FDA could potentially say, you know what, it's below the 20 part per billion limit and, and not require anything. That's happened a few times. In most cases, though, FDA still wants to see something done to the product, even if that level um, is less than the, than the U.S. level. And then reconditioning, as I mentioned, um, you know, sorting the product to remove defects is one of the main ways the product is, is reconditioned. It can also be blanched. Um, blanching is also effective at, um, at reconditioning. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, speakers. Uh, are there any questions uh, out there? I for? Have a yes, go ahead. Uh, for this issue, you have 
you are talking about for the EU market and Japan market, what about the Middle East, Middle East market? Because we have faced this issue in Middle East and Saudi Arabia from waterfront company. We have complained to the uh, Board of Almonds. They didn't cooperate us. They didn't give us any solution. We co complained your persons in Gulfport. They told us we will be go back. We will be fix out this matter. There is no solution from your end. What you are talking just for the EU and, and the Japan. It is not the policy that you will be president with only the particular market and the rest of the market you lack over. It's shame on you in this policy. So more of a statement than a question it sounded like. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, there's, 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 um, there's buyer seller you know, contracts and, and agreements, you know, for quality. And, and I would say aflatoxin should be part of that. And um, I, I've never heard of, you know, any seller of almonds not be willing to provide I, I an aflatoxin. I have. I want to okay. show you. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Question and answer yes, that? please. Can we wait until yeah. after the other questions are heard? I want and, to show yeah. you. I have the proof black and white. That's fine. We can wait until after the other questions are addressed. Thank you. Any other questions or statements? Yes. You mentioned that climate change will control the uh, aflatoxin. Uh, anything else we can do at home, like freezing or roasting, anything like that? Uh, it really, only, um, only the reconditioning to remove the serious damage or blanching have been shown to be effective for reducing levels of aflatoxin. Yeah, the heat won't denature it. Freezing won't either. Yes, question here? Uh, is this working? I'm not sure. Okay, we'll try. Is it on? No. Anyway. Um, just give, give them a sec. I think they'll. They it's on. It's, it's on now? Okay. I just wanted to say regarding the uh, abandoned uh, groves, abandoned groves mm -hmm. in San Diego. I'm from San Diego. And they. In order to set up the pest control districts for control of Asian stracillid, um, they wanted they organized growers so that growers were all on the same plan for control. But when they did that, they also instituted a local abandonment abatement protocol in through the county ordinances on nuisance for nuisance abatement so that any groves that were abandoned were required by the property owner to dispose of all the trees so that might be something that your counties can do I'm not sure. thank you question There has been um, quite a bit of work that's done on, been done on AF36. It has been shown to be very effective at displacing the toxigenic strains. Uh, we did a, a ramp up study, um, Thamus Michelades. I think I saw Thamus in the room. Yeah, there's Thamus. And so his, his lab's been working on this for several years. And um, the la last data we saw um, last year did show that is you know quite effective um, at displacing the toxigenic strains. We, we had less success demonstrating um, efficacy at reducing levels of aflatoxin, but that was more related to the difficulty in testing for aflatoxin itself. Um, but AF36 is very effective at, at displacing the toxigenic strains. Does the panel know if there's been any AF36 applications to almond orchards? I, I'm, I'm not aware of any. I, forgive me, Tamas, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but he and I spoke about this a few weeks back, and I forget exactly the order of, of your statements, but Yes, it'll reduce the atosidentic strains, but there was some difficulties in getting establishment or colonization. In, in pistachios, there's good proof that it works. In almonds, there's still some questions. When I left the discussion, I was like, okay, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, one, one of the differences with pistachios, too, is they have an incentive program for applying it. And so you have you know, all the orchards that are basically applying the AF36. Um, and so you got that collective benefit. With almond orchards, um, there's not, you know, if your neighbor's not doing it, um, there may be some challenges. And, um, but, but yes, Mel, you're right. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what, if anything, is the board going to be able to do about uh, abandoned orchards? That, that's a good question. I want to speak with this, this young lady, and I, I want to talk to... I can give you an example. Yeah. The thing is, in uh, Barbara and Barrow were involved, so we had a walnut orchard that was abandoned for five years across the street from us. When they finally took the stuff to us, you could just watch the dust come over to our orchard. We had the worst, I forget the diseases, but all rot, you name it. Yeah. It almost decimated. I, I want to say yes. I don't think it's within the legislation to allow the board to do anything like that at this point. I, not that I'm aware of. Gabrielle, is there um, anything that? I mean, I mean, the way it would work is what this lady was talking about. There's ways you can go and work with the TDFA or with mm -hmm. the county to set up programs that do that. But it's a, it's a process. So, so, so abatement is done at the county level through the Ag Commissioner. You know, that's the case for, let's say, Pierce's disease in abandoned grapevines, that's the case with the citrus. But you know, in both those cases, there are formal pest control districts that those organizations have set up that then work through the Ag Commissioner. And even then, I mean, I've been through several of these. Um, you know, the Ag Commissioner, they go and talk to the person, then they talk again, then they give them, they develop a plan for them to remove it, then they wait to see if they implement the plan, then they develop a new plan when they don't. It's kind of like kicking out a tenant, <laughs> you know, where you just, you know, there's the iterations, and, um, you know, sometimes it happens quickly, sometimes it can be years, and you're still trying to get the Ag Commissioner to officially say, sign the letter that says, if you do not remove this, the county will remove it. We will charge you on your property taxes for the removal. Um, that's very complicated and down the road. So you know, what can the Almond Board do? I don't know. But at the same time, that is a county level through the Ag Commissioner topic. And so um, I don't know what can be done at the statewide level. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's the, the official sort of process that exists right now is at that level, and, and it's not easy. I, I know this isn't much help, but we're not just ignoring it. But we're looking at and talking to people, what can we do? What, just that very question, what can we do about this? Mm -hmm. How do we go about this? Because you can't ignore it. No, it's only going to get worse as Sigma gets closer. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, Sigma will definitely accelerate that concern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other questions for the panel? Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what that was. I'm not exactly sure what I what the, this panel can do to help with that, but uh, look for members of the of the almond board. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I didn't get to your last question. Oh. <laughs> Is that okay? Oh,